but I want to challenge you this morning, and my intention, and I'm going to tell you right now, is to either make you very mad or very happy, but I will not tolerate indifference. I, if you're going to say, okay, yeah, no, 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 either get really angry at me or get happy at me, one or the other. At least I know you listened and I got your attention, but we're going to talk about some things this morning, okay? Are you guys ready? Can we go on a journey together? It's not going to be a long message, but it's going to be good, and I hope, see, uh, my endeavor is to make the gospel so simple anybody can get it. A child, a three-year-old, a four-year-old, they get it. It is not complicated. It is simple. And if you've escaped simple, you're not in the gospel anymore. You've cre- you, got this old, you got this other stuff going on. So we're going to keep it simple. And the best way to simplify the gospel, hey, try sharing the gospel with someone that's never been to church before. Ah, you can't use church words. And let me remind you, Jesus never used church words either. <laughs> Jesus used words the fishermen understood, lawyers understood, sinners understood. He used words of the day that they understood. He didn't use church words, but today we got all kinds of church lingo that only we understand because we like being in an, in an exclusive group, you know, like uh, we belong kind of thing. And uh, okay, all right. Anyways, okay, look, go to, go to uh, uh, oh, Luke chapter 10. On your way to Luke chapter 10, I'm going to read something from Psalm 67. Psalm 67 in the New Living Translation. It says, May God be merciful and bless us. May his face smile with favor on us. Interlude or Selah. Think about that. May your ways be known throughout the earth. Your saving power among people everywhere. God's desire is his saving power be known where? Let me, let's say that again. Where? Everywhere. May the nations praise you. Who? The nations. That's everybody. Skin color, every single person. There ain't nobody excluded from God's design and purpose. Oh God, yes, may all the nations praise you. Verse 4. Let the whole world sing for joy because you govern the nations with justice and guide the people of the whole world. Say law. Think about it. Verse 5, may the nations praise you, O God. Yes, may all the nations praise you. Then the earth will yield its harvest, and God, our God, will richly bless us. Yes, God will bless us, and people all over the world will fear him. There is a purpose behind us being blessed. Now, this is ancient Israel. And this is a time where the fullness of understanding that blessing was not known yet. It wouldn't be revealed until Jesus came, died, and rose again. And this blessing that we have today is the gift of salvation, the gift of forgiveness. Now notice God's design and purpose is you be blessed. Why? Because God is after the nations. See, Jesus, and, and if you've been following me on uh, the last few weeks, I've been on a series in evangelism and redefining what that looks like and what that is. In fact, the only purpose that you are still on earth is for evangelism. If you haven't figured that out yet, we're, we're going to get you there. We're, we're, that, that's the purpose. Like, like we're, gonna, we're, we're created to worship God, but we're going to be worshiping God for eternity. The reason you're here on earth is for the you sitting across from you in the cubicle at work. See, I knew I was going to either make you angry or make you excited. That, that's great. I need you here, though, okay? I need you there because there's a purpose behind you being saved and still being on earth. It's for the person across the street from you. Why? Because God loves that person that doesn't love him just as much as he loves Jesus. And God's system in design is for him to shine his favor on you so that they can look at you and see his face shining on your face and say, hey, what's going on with you? See, the Bible creates this idea that we get asked a lot of questions like this. Hey, why do you believe what you believe? Hey, Josh, what's the reason for that hope you have? Now, I ask myself, okay? Now, I'm asking you to do this too, but I'm not telling you to, uh, I'm not putting it on you because you'll get mad at me. But, but ask yourself this, how many times have I, have I been asked that question? Is this okay? Is this okay if we, uh, come on, are we okay? Okay, how many times have you been asked to give a defense for the hope that is in you? I, I did not say 
how many times have you had to defend your moral views? I said, how many times have you been asked to give a defense for the hope that's in you? <laughs> oh, okay, okay, good, good. I'm glad we're all on the same page. I can see where we're going somewhere. Luke chapter 10, Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. Okay, now before we read this, I have a question to ask you. Don't answer it out loud, and this is not a trick question. There's an actual number. How many commandments do you as a Christian have? I, I don't answer out loud. Don't answer out loud. I didn't hear anything. Don't answer out loud. Keep it inside, because I don't want anybody to get embarrassed or happy, you know. But answer it in your mind right now. How many commandments do you as a Christian have? And when you have that answer, what are they? Now, if you grew up in church in the world today, your answer may have sounded like something like 10, the Ten Commandments. Why? Because for some reason we adopted the Hebrew Bible, which is the Old Covenant, and it's not called Old Covenant because it's older than the New Covenant. It's called Old because it's now obsolete and vanishing away. Jesus set aside the old covenant to establish the new. The old covenant actually is not in effect anymore. Let me remind you, those 10 commandments are now obsolete. Why? Because Jesus established something new. Now, we didn't raise our kids really with 10. We raised them with nine. Because it was more convenient to avoid the Sabbath day one, right? How many of y'all enforce the Sabbath day commandment with your kids? And let me remind you what that is. That means no emails from Friday evening to Saturday at sundown. Ain't doing nothing. In fact, if you're very legalistic, you can't even go number two in the bathroom. Yes. John the Baptist was so legal. Anyways, okay, I don't want to get off track. Yes, so if you want to live by the Ten Commandments, make sure you don't relieve yourself from Friday night to Saturday night. You got to make sure you're fulfilling the law. That's why Paul said, hey, if you want to go put yourself under that, obliga- under that law, you are obligated to do all the law, which is 613 commandments. And if you miss it one little time, guess what? You're a breaker of all of them. So let's respect it for what it was, a perfect standard that we couldn't do. And Jesus came and fulfilled it for us. Amen for that. Thank you, Jesus. Or if you're... <laughs> If you're, uh, say, Josh, I know what the answer is. And if you were raised in school, your answer may be like the golden rule that we're taught, right? Treat others as you would like others to do unto you, right? How many remember that rule, right? Maybe that was your answer. Or maybe uh, your answer was this. It was uh, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, <laughs> you're wrong, but <laughs> it's okay. But, <laughs> okay, but, but you know, that, that's probably what your answer was, I'm guessing. is be, Why? Because I listen to a lot of sermons. I talk to a lot of people, and very few people actually even know what the commandment is for a Christian. I told you, I'm going to make you mad, or I'm going to make you happy. Indifference will not be tolerated. Jesus was asked a similar question in Luke chapter 10. Verse 25, it says, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him. The lawyers were always testing Jesus, trying to catch him. And a lawyer is what we would call an expert in the law, an expert of the Hebrew Bible, an expert of the old covenant that knew the ins and the outs. He knew everything about it, and his purpose in life was to make sure he pointed out all the areas you missed it. See, Jesus is, uh, uh, what's the word I'm going to use? harshest remarks were for these people who told you everything you did wrong without lifting a finger to help you. Okay. Verse 26, or verse 25, he said, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, hey, you're the lawyer, you tell me. And the dude answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said, you have answered rightly. Look, I did a good job. He answered correctly. Under the law, there were two great commandments. There were 613 commandments, but they were all wrapped around these two, which is love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, before we go into it a little bit further, I want you to look at Matthew 22. Jesus was asked this another time. In Matthew 22, Verse 34, it says, but when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. So they were sad, you see. 
<laughs> oh, gosh. Oh, man. Verse 35, then one of them, a lawyer. There's that lawyer again, huh? No, no offense to you lawyers in here. These guys were different. Okay, you're good. You're awesome. Um, uh, asked him a question, testing him and saying, teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Now, notice his question. He didn't ask him, what are the great commandments? Plural. He said, what is the singular great commandment in the law? Why? The lawyers were convinced that they were righteous. The Pharisees and the religious elite were, were convinced that they were obeying this one commandment, which is a vertical relationship. Now, the thing that I am troubled with is I find that even after Jesus was resurrected and we have the new covenant, our life is focused still on a vertical relationship instead of horizontal. What I mean is Jesus took care of the vertical relationship. You cannot improve on your relationship with God. And if you're sitting in here and thinking of all the religious ways you think you can, or you were taught in church, I can prove it to you, you can't improve. Why? How close are you to God? Where is he? In you. Hey, guess what? We, we come here, God is not inhabiting this building. God is inhabiting you. You are the holy temple. You cannot get any closer to God than you are right now. You guys aren't even two different people. You're one. You cannot improve on this relationship with God. So that really puts a wrench in all my religious treadmill running, trying to get closer to God, trying to get more favor, trying to get more righteous. Trying, what, how can you add more righteousness than the righteousness Jesus gave you? How can you add more holiness to the holiness Jesus gave you? How can you add more favor than salvation? Am I speaking some truth here? Am I making some sense here? But because we've adopted the old way and brought it in somehow into our new Christian life, we're still trying to focus on and de develop a vertical relationship with God that Jesus created for us and established for us because we could not for a purpose, which you'll see. But see, these religious Pharisees we're focused on vertical relationship, which is love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. So they went around, I'm loving God. Everything they did was with the idea of loving God. They did it to such a degree that it was okay for you to not love your neighbor so that you can love God. Mm. And now Jesus says, look, I know you're asking me what the great commandment is, so I'm gonna answer you. And before you can uh, uh, celebrate my answer, I'm gonna do something crazy. I'm going to add, this second is like it. So it's not in addition to or something different, but they go together hand in hand. He says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And he says, on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So he's saying, hey, Mr. Lawyer, guess how you do the first one? You do the first one by doing the second one. Uh. Hey, 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 I love it that we get together and we worship God. We lift our hands, we give our tithes and our offerings, and, and we pray, and we read our Bible. Guess what? None of that means a thing if you're not loving your neighbor. Let, let me say that again. None of that means a thing without love for your neighbor. You think you're loving God. Jesus says, you know how you love God? By loving your neighbor. Let me say that again. The way you love God is by loving your neighbor. Oh, this is getting real good. I can see it in your faces. If you guys could see the faces, he told, was it Jeremiah? Don't look at their faces. <laughs> it's troublesome, I'll tell you. I love you guys, but I want to keep pushing through. I, I got to throw a joke in there every now and so I can see a bright, pearly white every now and then, okay? But like I said, I'm going to make you angry, I'm going to make you, but I'm going to simplify this gospel for you. You're gonna leave here. For those of you that wanna do this gospel thing that are wondering, why am I here? Why do I exist? What am I doing? What is this church thing? What is this God thing all about? You're gonna leave here with the answer and know it. It's gonna be so simple. It's demanding, but it's powerful. It's demanding, but it's simple, and you'll do it, and it's gonna be power-packed. Man, you're gonna live a life of purpose and fun and adventure. He says, on these two hang all the law and the prophets. So basically, Mr. Lawyer, the way you love God is by loving your neighbor. Now, back to Luke, back to Luke and that lawyer in Luke chapter 10. So Jesus said, you answered rightly, do this and you'll live. But the lawyer, 
wanting to justify himself. Why would he want to justify himself? Because he's convinced that he's doing these things. So he says to Jesus to make sure he's on the right track, make sure they're on the same page. He says, hey, Mr. Jesus, who is my neighbor? In other words, what is the minimum loving requirement needed to inherit eternal life? What is the minimum of love I need to do in order to inherit eternal life? But before I answer that, or not before, I'm going to answer that question not with a Josh idea or what I think the answer of who your neighbor is. Let's look at the Bible and what, who your neighbor is, shall we? In Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18, look at this. This is where we find the commandment to love your neighbor as yourself. It should be there. There it is. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people. Say, say that with me. Your people. Okay, hey, eyes, all right, eyes are here. Those are the people that look like you, act like you, talk like you, believe like you, think like you, have the same morals as you, have the same values as you, and watch this, watch this, vote like you. But love your neighbor as yourself. Who is your neighbor? The ones that vote like you, act like you, talk like you, speak like you, think like you, believe like you, have the same values, have the same morals. That is your neighbor. Guess what? That ain't hard to do. Which is why Israel was in a way, and I mean this in respect, racist. If you were not a Jew, you were a dog. And I'm not making that up. Hey, you remember Christian Peter? What was, the, what was his introduction to the Gentile centurion Cornelius? What was his introduction? Hey, Cornelius, nice to meet you. God sent me here, and you know that it's, it's not lawful for me to hang out with you. Nice to meet you too, Peter. Thanks. Welcome. It was actually against the law for a Jew to associate with somebody that wasn't their own. I wonder if we have brought some of that old into the new. Right? We've reserved our love for the ones sitting next to us that believe like us. But if you didn't vote for who you know who, guess what? I'm not going to love you. I'm going to talk about all the bad you're doing and how evil you are and how wicked you are. Because you don't see the light. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly what I had in mind. So he says, Jesus, who's my neighbor? And Jesus, now imagine all the people. Because Jesus was, he was transitioning. Jesus was transitioning us from the old to a new. He, he, on the cross, he would bleed and then use that blood to present it before the Father, which would establish a new and better covenant, making the old obsolete. All this old is obsolete. That's not Josh's words. That's Hebrews chapter 7 and 8 and 9 and 10. It's, it's gone. God's not there anymore. Why do we have the old covenant? Because a dude back in like the 300 AD decided he wanted to study about Jesus' Jewish heritage. Okay, we're not going there. Okay. Whew. Jesus is transitioning us to something new. And so here's an opportunity for Jesus to reveal the original nature and intent of God was what we read in Psalm 67 was what? The world be blessed. The nations be blessed. See, God was raising up Israel, not so that Israel could be like, wow, look how special we are. God was raising up Israel just like he's raising up you so that you and Israel could bless the nations. Purpose behind the blessing, purpose behind salvation, you're saved. But Jesus said, freely you've received, freely give. And what I've been trying to tell you is you have not received until you give. If you are still holding unforgiveness, all it tells me is you have not yet received forgiveness from your father. If you are still not loving, it means that you have not received love from your father. The, uh, look, to the extent that you are giving is the, extent, is the extent that you've received. I'm telling you this not to make you feel guilty or condemned, but to let you know so that you don't live in deception and think you're doing the Jesus thing and think you're doing the Christian life when you ain't. Let's just not be deceived. Let's just see, look, I'm receiving so I can give. What does love do? For God to love the world, what did he do? He gave. What did he give? Everything. Why do we think it's anything less than giving my life, my entire life, everything about me for my spouse? Anything less than that is limiting the gospel. Whew. The power of the gospel. 
And so here's Jesus, and he's about to have the opportunity to help transition in the new, and all the Jewish people are listening, and he's about to redefine neighbor. And look what he says, and this, if this parable doesn't hit you, well, I hope it does. Verse 30, then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Now according to the lawyer's answer, this man who was a priest who thought he was justified, was he loving God? No, he wasn't. Why? Because he didn't love who? You guys are so good. Next, likewise, a Levite, another religious elite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked, and what did he do? He passed by on the other side. Based on what the lawyer said, did he love God? No. Why? Because he didn't love his neighbor. You getting it? You're following what Jesus is saying? But now look, Jesus says, but a certain Samaritan, wait, stop. All the Jews around now are waiting to hear Jesus say the words that the Samaritan is the one that robbed the guy. And the Samaritans about to get what's coming to him because the Samaritans were worse than Gentiles. The Samaritans were a mixed race of human. They were half Jew, half Gentile, and they thought they worshiped Jehovah God, but they didn't follow the rules that the Jews did. And so the Jews despised the Samaritans. They wouldn't eat with Samaritans. They would not touch a a Samaritan. I bet you they didn't look at Samaritans. They would go the long way to avoid their house. They'd go the long way to avoid the village. Jesus went the long way to find them. (laughs) But guess what? According to the law, they didn't have to love the Samaritan. In fact, the Samaritans and the Jews had some bad history. You remember when they were trying to rebuild the temple in Ezra and Nehemiah? Guess who the enemy was? The Samaritans. So they didn't like them. And now Jesus is mentioning a Samaritan in this story, and they're thinking, okay, the Samaritans finally get what's going to come to him. Yes, Jesus, you get him. But Jesus makes the Samaritan the hero. Let me translate that for you. Let me translate that for you today. All of you Republicans, he's making the Democrat the hero. All of you Democrats, he's making the Republican the hero. He's making the dude that you don't respect the hero of the story. Can I say amen? Uh, No, I said, uh, can I say amen? I hope this is challenging you. Because if, if the worst person on the earth, Jesus is making the hero, what does that, what, what does that mean for me right now, today, tomorrow? And he continues, he says, check it out. As he journeyed, the Samaritan came where he was, and when he saw him, had compassion. So is the Samaritan who the Jews thought were apart and out of the covenant with God. They didn't, they didn't have a relationship with God. And yet Jesus is saying he's the only one out of all the Jews and the religious elite that loved God. Why? What did he do? Loved his neighbor. Who is our neighbor? Every body. He says, so he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine and set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn and took care of him. I'm sure this was inconvenient. I'm sure he didn't plan on stopping. He was obviously on a journey going somewhere. He had a donkey. He had supplies. Maybe he didn't have enough supplies for an extra day. But because his neighbor was in trouble, he stopped what he was doing. He picked him up. He used his substance, his time, his ability, where he was in convenience to take care of this man, and that wasn't it. He didn't drop him off at the end, but Jesus has the audacity to say the words on the next day. So this man stayed the night, making sure this dude was on the men making sure he was doing better and then when he left provided funds for the innkeeper to continue taking care of him what does love look like looks like that guess what you cannot love when it's convenient that's not love the verse 36 so jesus says which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among thieves and now jesus has him Because the lawyer knows this answer, and if he answers correctly and answers legitimately, he's binding himself and admitting to Jesus that he is not a lover of God. And he says, the one that showed mercy, and what does Jesus say? Go and do 
likewise. Now I ask you again the same question I asked you at the beginning, which was what? How many commandments do we as Christians have? And what are the commandments? And if it's not 613 commandments that you have to live by. It's not even 10 or 9. It's actually 1. John chapter 13. Jesus is transitioning us from the old to the new. In John chapter 13, verse 33. From John chapter 13 to John chapter 17, this is right before Jesus is going to the cross. These are his last words on earth to his disciples, and they are the words for us, the church. They're new covenant words. And he says in verse 33, little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, where I am going, you cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment. Say new. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Who is the one another? Everybody. Now, at this moment, most gods leverage a command with either a promise or a threat. Am I right? Or if we're parents, we leverage commands to our kids with a promise or a threat. You better clean up your room. If you don't clean up your room, if you do clean up your room, right? Jesus does not leverage this new commandment with a promise or a reward. He doesn't leverage this commandment with a threat or something bad that will happen to you if you don't. He leverages it with his own love. He says, I am telling you, your new commandment is to love one another, not, please don't, do not miss this, and don't walk away missing this. You are not allowed to love each other the way you love yourself. You are not allowed to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. It is not about vertical. It is about horizontally loving one another, not as you love yourself. No, 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 that was the old. The new is love one another to what extent? the defined extent of the way Jesus loved you. So much greater, so much more powerful, so much more demanding, but so simple. One commandment as a Christian, one. Nothing else matters. Wouldn't it be something if like the early church, the world knew us by this command rather than by what we believed? I'm sweating now. Y'all got me worked up here. The early church lived in a time of absolute government persecution, religious persecution. Everybody persecuted. But you know what they did? They loved. And they loved so big and so great to the extent that Jesus loved them. They laid their lives down for the one another, that eventually those same governments and those same people that persecute them were overcome by the love that that church showed. And, to, and then Rome became a Christian nation. There is a cross in the Colosseum today where at one time Christians were being eaten alive by lions and instead of them insulting and cursing the ones executing them, they loved them. And today there is a cross at the entrance to the Colosseum. Why? Love never fails. You are not commanded to love one another the way you love yourself. Why? Because then you are defining love. Jesus defined love by the way he loved you when he gave his life for you. Paul's imperatives in all of his letters are examples of what loving one another looks like. Look at Paul's one anothering. Submit to one another. Forgive one another. Encourage one another. Restore one another. Accept one another. Care for one another. uh, Bear with one another. And carry one another's burdens. And the list could keep going. And why in every instance does he say to do these things? Because Christ did it for you. Husbands, love your wives to what extent? To the way Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. 
Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands. Why? Because we submitted to Christ. Everything revolves around the love of Christ. May I remind you in Galatians 5, 6, the only thing that matters. Listen, listen. The only thing that matters is faith expressing itself through love. Yes, that's believing how much God loves you. That's the faith part. But the only way we're actually going to see that you love God is seen in how you love one another. John said in 1 John chapter 4, look at this. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. That word cannot is not talking about impossibility or ability. It is talking about opportunity. You love God by loving one another. Imagine if the world knew us by the way we loved one another. Imagine if we loved one another to the definition the way Jesus loved us. The one another not being the ones that are easy to love. Not being the ones that treat you good, believe like you, and vote like you. I'm talking about the ones that didn't vote like you, that don't have the same morals and values, and we are commanded to love them to the extent that Jesus loved us. So many people, I, I'm always encouraging, share the gospel. Get people saved. It's the greatest way we can love anybody is by getting them saved, introducing them to Jesus. But the biggest fear that people have from sharing the gospel with someone is their lack of knowledge. They say, I don't know how, I don't know what to say. Who said you had to say anything? Listen, it says in 1 Corinthians 13, I'm closing, I'm done, I, I'm just closing here. In 1 Corinthians 13, look at this. I don't, ha I don't have it, Bonnie, so it's just, just flowing here. 1 Corinthians 13, is it okay if I read this real quick? In verse one, Paul says, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels. Oh, that's awesome, Paul, cool. But he says, but have not love, uh-oh, I become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. Yikes. Imagine if our prayer life wasn't for ourselves, but for others. Imagine if the tongues we spoke in was for the purpose of me getting some revelation to share with you. Not just so I can have some more info. See, our objective is not to make smarter Christians. Our objective is to make Christians more bold and loving. That's it. The bolder you are and the more loving you are, the kingdom grows. The more informational you are, honestly, the more resistible you become. Knowledge is only good when it's used to love. Remember, Paul said knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. As long as the knowledge you have is used to build up the person next to you, good. But if the knowledge you have is only meant to build you up, not good. I knew I'd get some thunder, thunderous applauses here. I knew it. But, 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 but have, I, have I made something up? Is this not the Bible? Did, how many commandments do we have, guys? One. And it is not love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. That was the old. The new is what? Love one another to the extent that Christ loved you. Read John 13 to 17, and Jesus says it multiple times times. Read the book of 1 John. John says it multiple times. Why? Because you are loving God when you love one another. In verse 2 of 1 Corinthians 13, he says, and though I have the gift of prophecy, that's awesome, and understand all mysteries and all knowledge. Wait a minute. Did you just read what Paul said? Understands all mysteries and all knowledge. How do you know that dude is going to be rich. You know why? Because he's going to write a lot of books. Again, understand all mysteries and all knowledge. That means you're not missing a thing. 
And though I have all faith, well, hey, that's why I'm coming to church. I need to build my faith. Why? I need a better house. I need, a more, I need more cars. I need more money. I need a bigger successful business. Imagine if our faith wasn't used on ourselves, but for the one sitting next to you. Maybe that's actually the purpose of faith. Oh my gosh. Ask Jesus, if you don't believe me, ask him why you have faith, why his faith is in you. Because check it out, check it out, check it out. As long as you are vertically minded, faith for me, faith for my life, faith for more, guess what? You will not be ever loving God. God loves you. Don't misunderstand. You're righteous and holy, but you are not actively loving God and you're making zero difference in the world. Imagine if immediately you went from vertical and said, okay, I have faith that Jesus, you actually did save me. Boom, who's left? My neighbor, the one another. And now I use faith to believe how much he loves me and love you. But Josh, if I do that, how, who's gonna take care of me? It's interesting that Abraham didn't actually get the miracle until he got his eyes off of himself and prayed for someone else that had the same problem. Context, Abraham couldn't have kids. So what'd he do? He got his eyes off of himself, stopped trying to build up faith for himself and said, you know what? I'm gonna use the faith I have to pray for them who can't have kids. What happened was he released himself and let Jesus take care of him. I'm, yeah, I thank you for that little clap in the back. I am preaching so good right now. You don't even understand. I am making Jesus so happy. I can feel Jesus jumping up and down in my spirit. He is so pleased with this message. He is so happy. Like I said, you're either gonna be happy or upset. Indifference will not be tolerated. You either leave here loving nobody or you leave here loving people the way Christ loves you. I will have nothing else. I will not have this. I'm only gonna love the guy that likes me. I'm only gonna love the dude that's like me. No, you are to love the liberal. You are to love, to love the right wing. You are to love everybody. Opposite skin color, opposite thing. They're every, hey, he, it's for everybody. And the, what Jesus said in John chapter three, this is how the world is gonna know that you are my disciple. How? By the way you love. They are not gonna know you're saved by your moral stance your moral views. Well, I'm standing up for this. Great, good for you. How's your love walk? How are you loving people the way Jesus loves you? <sighs> Jesus said, the world is gonna know I'm alive. The world is gonna know you're my disciple. Guess what? If we're his disciple, that means he's still alive. So what he's saying in essence is the world is gonna know that there is a God by the way that you love. Imagine if we use our faith for the person sitting next to you and the person across the street. Imagine if our prayers were filled with, Lord, give me opportunities to share your love. Give me opportunities to share your gospel. Lord, I pray for that person that they be blessed with a new job. Lord, I pray for that person that they be increased and that they have more. Paul goes on to say, though I have all faith that I could move mountains. That's some pretty big faith. Okay? But he said, if I don't have love, he says this, three words, I am nothing. Come on, Paul, don't make that declaration. That's, you can't confess that, Paul. You're the righteousness of God. Not if I don't have love, not if I'm not showing it, I'm nothing. All that faith, all the knowledge, all the mysteries I understand, worthless. If I'm not using it to love. You know, after that, he goes into, you guys all know the love chapter. <laughs> yeah, maybe. It's okay. Love is awesome. Just read it. And then, and then he, he, goes, he goes off on, I know in part, I see in part. This is Paul. He's saying, I don't get it all. I don't understand everything. I don't have all the knowledge. And I'm answering the question of, I want to share the gospel, but I don't know what to say. Paul's saying this, yeah, I don't really know what to say either. I don't have it all together. I don't understand everything. And then he sandwiches that statement with, I don't know everything. The top part was love, what love is. 
then I don't know everything. And the bottom part is now abide these three, faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. Sandwiched in between I don't know everything is love because love closes all the loopholes. Love takes care of where you don't know. Loving one another the way Christ loved you, that will win them. That will win them to Jesus. The way you treat them like the Samaritan took care of that man. I don't know everything, but I can love the way Jesus loved me. This isn't a competition about who knows the most, who can memorize the most Bible verses. It's a competition really of who can love the most. Imagine a marriage where the husband and wife were in a submission competition. Who can submit to each other the most? Imagine a church where, what, where we had competitions about who was loving more. I'm gonna beat you this week, Johnny. No, you're not. I'm gonna love you more, Sally. Don't you worry, I'm gonna get you. Imagine if all of your friends at work couldn't stop talking about how kind you were and how much you gave of your time and you were inconvenienced to take care of somebody that was nothing like you. I'll tell you what, we would have the best jobs. Why? Because that's who companies want to hire. Any business owners in here? You want to find the guy that can love well. Why? Because they're not going to be late to work. Why? Because they're going to love you. And they're not going to cheat and steal. Why? Because that wouldn't be loving you. See, see, we don't need the 613 commandments about all the do's and don'ts. All we need is to love one another as Christ loved me. See, I can't commit adultery to my wife. Why? Because I wouldn't be loving her the way Christ loved me. Christ would never commit adultery on me. See, I can't steal or lie to you. Why? Because that would be not loving you. I don't value you and love you to a degree that you deserve the truth. And Christ would never do that to me. He always gives me truth. He would never lie to me, so I can't lie to you because that wouldn't be loving you the way Christ loves me. Simple, demanding, powerful, world-changing. Cannot express it enough. Let us love one another, not as you love yourself, but the way Christ loved you. Paul was persecuting the church. He went from persecuting the church, arresting Christians, having them executed, thrown in prison, and guess who ordained that behavior? The high priest. For some reason, they were justified in killing other people. I wonder if sometimes when we see the people that we don't agree with in the news media suffer, we quietly rejoice. They got what they were coming to. See, if they believed like me, they wouldn't have happened. That wouldn't have happened. Paul had such a conversion and such an encounter with Jesus. What's interesting is I find in the new covenant, the, the old covenant, when we obey, we get blessed, right? The old covenant, if you obeyed God, you got blessed. Let me point out in the new covenant, when you obey, you get persecuted. Obedience in the new covenant brings suffering. Yeah, that, that went over well. <laughs> Paul experienced suffering after suffering. Why? Because he was being obedient to the commandment to love one another. The devil doesn't like that, so he, he tries to stop you from doing that. And, and what, look what Paul, look at this love. Look at this love. These people that were against Paul weren't just using emails and Instagram and Facebook to say things. They are picking up stones and throwing them at Paul killed Paul. They, they whipped Paul. They beat Paul. They lied about Paul. They kicked him out of cities. They tried to assassinate him. They, the 40 men took a hunger vow that they weren't going to eat again until he was killed. They, they were always conspiring to kill him. How many of y'all need some help? Like, you know, you got some people trying to kill you. That was Paul on a daily basis. He said, I die daily. In other words, his life is and the people that were trying to kill him, this is what Paul says. Read it for yourself in Romans 9. His own countrymen that were trying to kill him every day with anger. He said, I wish I, 
I wish I could be accursed that they would be saved. know that. People that are mean to me, I want to get hurt. People that are mean to me and my family, fool, I put a, I, I take care of you. You know, I got some friends I could call. You ain't going to treat me and my family like that. Uh-uh. Paul, you know what he was, his desire was for the people that was hurting him, that he could be a curse from Christ so that they could be saved. Let, let me, let me interpret that for you. Paul's saying, I'll go to hell so they go to heaven. Not the people that were nice to him. What is that? That's what happens when Jesus comes in your heart. Why? Jesus died so you wouldn't. Guess what happens when he comes in there? That same attitude in nature lives in you. I'll sacrifice me. No, 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 not you. I'll sacrifice me. Not my interest, yours. Not my preferences, yours. Not my time, yours. Where is that love? I'm telling you, it's going to come back. It's coming back, and the world will be changed by the way we love. Your Belinda is going to be changed because y'all are going to love. People are going to be knocking down them doors, and instead of showing up when they're going to be showing up, you're going to be showing up hours early to get yourself a seat. Why? Because people can't wait to get around these people that love so well. Everyone was created to be recipients of this love. I'm so filled with the presence of God right now. I don't know about you. I'm so pleased right now and happy. Let's have everybody's heads bowed and eyes closed. One more thing. I'm sorry. It's okay. I've just, I just felt, there's, there's a, I just felt this, that I was reminded of it's, it, we can believe and agree with the gospel in our mind without ever experiencing the reality of it. We can believe in Jesus without ever experiencing his person and the reality of him actually being with us. And I find that happened with Peter when he had the vision, when he was in the trance and the vision came of the sheep coming down with all the unclean animals and God said, eat. And Peter said, no, Lord, I ain't eating that. It's unclean. And he did that three times, and he still didn't get it. You can have all the spiritual experiences in the world. You can have visions, trances, prophecies, miracles, left and right happening, and still not get it. Peter didn't get it until he went to the one another's house and shared the gospel with him. Let me say that again to you. You can come to church and you can have all the spiritual experiences, but until you share the gospel and love the one another, it will not be a reality. You, you won't get it. You, no, you'll agree with it. You may even have, you probably know more than I do, but I'll tell you what, Jesus is so real. Amen. Awesome. Okay, cool. Thanks, guys. Woo. All right. Hey, it's time to receive our 